Welcome everybody after the coffee break. We will now have a presentation, Kikari Key, Universal Wireless Keyboard Sniffing for the Masses, um, by Thorsten Schröder and Max Moser from Remote Exploit. I'm looking forward to it. Yeah. Good morning. Good morning, everyone. Um, yeah, we will talk today about uh, wireless keyboard sniffing, obviously. Um, <clears throat> first of all, I have a small warning slide. Um, analyzing someone's uh, data transmission could bring you to jail in some countries. So you're just allowed to verify your own security of your transmission of keystrokes, for example. Um, what is this talk all about? <clears throat> we had qu quite a few talks on that topic, but um, we had some major improvements during the last few days, really the last few hours especially. <laughs> last night. Um, yeah. And so we are able today to, let's say, talk about the current state in the various uh, transmission techniques used by wireless devices, starting from 20 c 27 megahertz based radio transmission on older devices over Bluetooth, just some slides on the topic of Bluetooth till, till the um, proprietary 2.4 gigahertz based cheap devices which actually replace the old 27 megahertz. Yeah, this talk is about the current project state, uh, as we told you before. Uh, we didn't finish uh, yet, uh, the, the entire project yet, so it's still work in progress and uh, we are uh, happy to have some cool stuff to show to you. Um, so yeah, we are able to uh, show uh, how we can send keystrokes to uh, 2.4 gigahertz uh, receivers and yeah, we will talk about the gigahertz stuff later. Yeah. So about uh, the evolution of the keyboards, a quick overview. Uh, wireless keyboards started with uh, that infrared stuff. Um, maybe you have seen it in your uh, room upstairs in the hotel for the, for the uh, TV system. It seems to be an infrared device. The problem with that is obviously line of sight requirement. So they replaced it with a cheap transmission technology. That's the 27 megahertz based ones. They are extremely cheap. You can extremely build cheap uh, transmitters and receivers, and it's quite well known. 27 megahertz is in the range of uh, the same frequency band as um, citizen band, so 11 meters. And yeah, next was the, the evolution to the Bluetooth keyboards. We'll tell you something about it, but in general, those um, keyboards were quite much hyped in the early days, but uh, there are only a few vendors which actually sells them. Um, Logitech has some keyboards available. They are all quite expensive. Yeah, and they looked for a better alternative, which is cheaper and easier to use. So they go back to a simple transmitter scenario in the proprietary 2.4 gigahertz one. So first, about 27 megahertz. <clears throat> There's one important thing in here. It's a pure one-way communication in all the implementation we have seen so far. So there is an obvious problem. This was already uh, posted to BugTrack in 2001 by a company called Daten Treuhand. Um, they found out if you buy two uh, identical receivers and you hit connect on them, so to bring the receiver into the state where he can um, uh, interconnects with a keyboard and you press the connect button on the keyboard, both receiver will <coughs> receive the keyboard key and so both will receive then the keystrokes. So that's the simplest attack scenario in all the implementation we have seen so far. This works really for all the old vendors. The problem is you have to force the, uh, the uh, let's say, target to do a resync during a defined time frame where you are waiting there with your receiver. So it's not that practical. You can jam him so he tries to reconfigure it, but I mean, there are better options. <coughs> so we were 
analyzing the signal because we did not have a clue what is going on there. And on all the implementation, uh, we found some middle or delay encoding in place for putting the binary data onto the uh, frequency. Uh, that's, this was quite new for me, and it took as good a head of a head edge because Microsoft, um, let's say, made a variation of the symbols behind the, the Miller encoding. So um, it looked at first quite OK, but at the end, the data was completely messed up, and it took us some time to analyze that. <coughs> But it's straightforward, so you have some kind of a, a compression in there and a pretty obvious um, signal pattern, which basically is um, typical for Miller. It's that you have a signal period of one, one and a half, and two. That's pretty unique. Um, yeah. That's a really early stage of research uh, when analyzing and reverse engineering this protocol, uh, yeah. analyzing the signal and find out how how the signal works actually. Exactly. After we were able to <coughs> understand what is going on there and what type of encoding it is, we just looked at the, the patterns uh, during the transmissions. And you can clearly see if I press three times an A, for example, on a keyboard, um, you can see some patterns three times. If you zoom in, um, we were able to see that, for example, that's log Logitech. that. Um, each keystroke consisted out of two, basically retransmission. Uh, it's quite fun that um, older versions of the keyboards transmitted three times. Newer uh, ones are using only two um, repeatings. So there is uh, some kind of a backward compatibility guaranteed by that. Yeah, by understanding the patterns in there, we were able to basically decode the data and get some binary uh, tables out of it. Um, we just added the Logitech ones here. There is another table for Microsoft, but we presented it already on different um, slideshows. But for Logitech, it's quite obvious. Um, you can see that some parts of the table are changing when you press a key down or a key up. So what's noted there in the state, you can see that always when I c press a key down, there's a one. and uh, if the key is released, it's a key up. So on the state field, you can see it's up or down. Then you have some parts which change when you change the keyboards, and some parts which will change when you have a keystroke. So that's basically all the process on, on the different vendors. So we analyzed first the signal, then coding. Luckily, it was always middle. And uh, then just analyzed what is in there, what's not. It's uh, Quite fun that Logitech uh, transmits it in clear text, except you add some additional, let's say, software encryption. So you have to install a specific driver. Then you have to type some passwords, which, which is shown <coughs> to you on the, on the screen. And then you have an additional encryption in place. We did not look at, at that one. Uh, for Microsoft, it was quite easy. They transmitted the same. Yeah. Uh, they, did not transmit it in clear text. They transmitted it encrypted. They had a, a one byte XOR key. <laughs> the hardest part was actually not depending on sniffing the, the sync signal instead of, of knowing what language is the target actually typing. And just as a side information, uh, we came up with the ID. Um, as, as you have a key and you have a value, if you XOR them, you always get the same result when the same key is pressed. So we came up with the idea of using www dot as an identifier that three times the same key was pressed. Yeah. And uh, if the dot was pressed after the three identical transmitted packets, we assume that we have the right key. That's how our device works. So we didn't yeah. introduce uh, the key, key device yet. So it's the small. Uh, PCB here. Um, we built a an own receiver and uh, for for the for the wireless keyboard stuff uh, for t uh, 27 megahertz. And yeah, we wrote uh, the software to uh, crack the XR key for Microsoft keyboards on the fly by performing a some kind of a statistical uh, analysis of the of the uh, crypto which goes uh, through the air. 
Yeah, and that's what he told. So we, we assume that the user is used to type www dot uh, or, for example, yeah, um, start uh, with capital letters at the beginning of a sentence. And that's, yeah, the meta characters are not encrypted and that's why we, we are able to perform this uh, analysis on the fly on the small device, which is uh, based on, on an AVR, 8-bit uh, microcontroller. Uh, so it's quite simple. Um, we don't go in, in too deep on that uh, 27 megahertz thing and Microsoft because it's quite well documented. And we wanted to show you the, the new technology at least in more detail. But um, finally, uh, we have implemented also the Logitech protocol during the last few uh, days. So we are now able to show you that it's working, actually. Uh, the Microsoft our was there. Our goal was to build an own device to be able to connect a real antenna to uh, our device so we can maybe uh, receive keystrokes and all the stuff uh, from a bigger distance. So Microsoft guarantees to be able to receive those uh, keystrokes uh, within one meter. And yeah, we are able to receive keystrokes uh, like five or 10 meters. Depending on your antenna. Depending on the antenna, right? That was the main problem in this uh, uh, 27 megahertz, 11 meters band. The antenna is quite huge. <laughs> that's, that's why we also had our focus uh, on 2.4 gigahertz because the antennas are quite small. We don't go into too detail on the on the uh, let's say firmware itself, <coughs> but it's it's yeah, the firmware this itself. This is the user interface. Yeah. If you connect uh, using your uh, USB uh, serial uh, cable, um, the Kikiriki -Kiki device is USB powered, and you can also uh, use the device using the the serial console, so this is the so menu. The menu and the whole, uh, let's say, usage is implemented into the firmware, so you just need basically a serial terminal to connect it. And for example, you can check the configuration of the system. You can switch on signal strength monitoring when you type something. Um, yeah, there is a possibility to, to um, add an SD card into the device so all the keystrokes get locked. So we can use two gigabyte uh, SD cards for saving and storing all of the keystrokes in raw format, so encrypted, and also the plain text data is also stored on the SD card for later analysis. Now it's rebooting again. <laughs> um, the TRF chip, which is actually the receiver chip, is um, capable of capturing two, um, two channels. And yeah, we were able, using the firmware, to switch to the channels. And it's quite fun that the chip actually implemented all the common, um, the common frequencies in one chip. Yeah. OK. Now, just for the Logitech, I just have the keyboard here. And yeah. Wow, this the seems to be working. Logitech is not transmitting any encryption, so uh, this is quite straightforward. One special behavior of Logitech is that they switch channels um, on certain time, or if you press the button, they will switch channels. I guess that's just for not interfering with other keyboards inside the same room. So it's quite straightforward, just typing, and the receiver will get the result. Um, because this was kind of cool, but um, we wanted to have it without a computer. Um, we built it a small battery pack, uh, but we had a small problem today. The battery cells are almost done. Empty. So, <laughs> so I have to power it using USB now, but um, just to give you an idea what you can do, there is an additional user available, so you can connect anything that understands Uzot, uh, basically a serial uh, connection to the Kikiriki. You power it up and we also try to connect an iPhone to the Kikiriki device, for example, to see all the keystrokes on the iPhone device, but we had some problem. So for example, trouble. here I built a small um, LCD device, or oh, not that small, but an LCD device. And if I type now here, you should 
yeah, you should see keystrokes. So, I mean, together with the battery pack, that's quite fun. And this scares even my mother, so <coughs> you don't need actually <laughs> a, a, uh, a computer to, to visualize what's the threat behind of it. And, I mean, you can replace that LCD with a, mm, a handy and using as a modem, for example. Then you just have to modify the firmware a bit. And when it's writing the character there, it's transmitted over uh, not a protocol, so kind of a replay, actually. That's why we call it u universal keyboard sniffing device. Yeah, restrictions in 27, uh, 27 megahertz. It's obviously the antenna. 11 meters is the best, um, let's say, full-size antenna of the wavelength. That's a real problem. Um, you can take smaller ones. I have here a, uh, well, PCB antenna connected to it, and it works, but the, the range is quite limited. Um, but that's not only a problem of the antenna. Um, we started to implement the signal capturing, let's say, the wrong way around. So um, actually, we did not implement the error correction properly. So um, we lose also immediately still key work strokes. In progress, yeah. Yeah. As soon as we have the error correction in place, we expect, even with cheap antennas, it's extremely um, improved. Uh, but that's not really the problem because we have an SD card in there. It's quite small. You can add a battery pack and put it somewhere for testing your security. <coughs> so, I mean, there is the limitation of the size, but it's... Okay, let's uh, switch over to Bluetooth. I guess it's just three slides. Um, I don't want to talk about the vulnerabilities available in Bluetooth and what was possible with injection and stuff like that, but just give you focus on keyboards, what's going on on there. Um, Bluetooth is extremely popular, um, or at least in the mobile world, so everyone knows that. Um, uh, the main difference compared to different other transmission techniques is that um, the security mechanism aren't let's say, accessible for the developer or for the operating system because it's realized already on the transmitting um, device within the, the firmware. So it's, um, if it's badly implemented, the developer cannot do a thing about it except adding an additional layer on the application. So all this stuff, which is important, pairing process and the encryption uh, key exchange is handled by the device itself. This makes the requirements on the device, on the transmitting device, um, quite a bit higher, so it's quite expensive to develop that uh, chip or transmitter compared to another technology. Um, and another thing is it's uh, hopping quite often within the frequencies, so this makes it quite, let's say, hard to sniff without a huge amount of money available for a private person. Um, yeah. That's the major drawbacks, I guess, on Bluetooth. It's too expensive. That's why uh, only a few expensive keyboards are available on the market. Then uh, sniffing is possible. Um, so if you um, have a frontline uh, uh, front Bluetooth sniffer, you can sniff it using the Windows software. Or if you find on the internet the, uh, the demo version, there is a firmware inside of it, which you can flash onto your Blue Core 3 CSR dongle, and then you can use a public available tool which basically reads out all the information needed to crack the pin. Um, simple pairing should fix that by changing the, the key exchange handling, um, but the problem in most Bluetooth bugs was basically a buggy implementation. So uh, you can inject stuff without encryption, or you can uh, add some hidden channels. So um, the implementation was quite often quite buggy. So this is what it looks like when you, when you sniff it. So the first window is basically the frontline.c or CSLC code uh, sniffing for that uh, information. It gives you the command you have to copy into the other window and start the pin crack, and then you have the pin, and then you can um, actually listen to it or associated with it. So it's, it's basically done, but the problem is you have to sniff during the pairing process. Um, that's the current state, as far as I know, and which is relevant to the keyboards. So 
So okay, the next and yeah, most modern uh, kind of uh, uh, wireless keyboard is based on a proprietary 2.4 gigahertz uh, technique. Um, the most devices we have seen so far uses a Nordic semiconductor uh, transceiver chip, and get this here. Hello. Two weeks ago. Here. Yeah. Hmm? Oh. Okay. So it's two yeah. examples. Those are the state of the art keyboard devices. Um, the Microsoft one is, uh, uh, was released in two, 2009, this year, in, in the middle of the year, I guess. So it's uh, quite new and not, not that old, like the uh, 27 megahertz stuff. So we are not talking about Bluetooth or Zigbee here. Uh, it's not wireless LAN. It's, uh, it's based on a technology called Shockburst or Enhanced Shockburst. Um, yeah, and uh, the Nordic Semiconductor NRF24 uh, family is mostly used in the wireless keyboard devices. Um, I had seen one wireless keyboard device, it was, which was a, a no-name uh, product. And uh, I, I, I don't know if they are also using the, those chips, but yeah, it's most likely to find those chips in every device which is able to communicate over the air, not, not only keyboards, but also uh, other uh, devices and uh, gadgets. Yeah, uh, why are they switching to this uh, proprietary 2.4 gigahertz uh, technique? It's uh, cost saving those uh, semiconductor chips costs around $3 for end users, so I guess uh, uh, the cost is uh, uh, quite low. Uh, the compact form factor, for example, the antenna is really small and is able to uh, yeah, um, reach devices which are uh, maybe 10 meters far away, so yeah, the distance is also a uh, it's faster, <coughs> so we need less uh, transmit time. Uh, that means we, ha we had less uh, power consumption, which is also a key uh, for this. Was, what technology. was the statement of the vendors about the time of the battery? Uh, around three years. Uh, yeah. the, the battery should stay for uh, three years, so yeah, that's quite okay. Please get on the So. Ah, that was food. <laughs> okay. Noch eins zurück. So, eins zurück. Yeah. Well, I don't want to talk a lot about the shockburst uh, protocol, but this is how it looks like. So we have this is uh, the the frame which is transmitted over the air over the radio link. So we have we have a preamble which is uh, defined by the shockburst protocol uh, to uh, uh, to enable the receiver to uh, yeah identify a valid. Um, Shockburst frame. Um, the preamble is followed by the the device address, uh, which is up to five bytes, and a mi minimum of uh, three bytes. Um, we have some packet control fields, which are not interesting for us. Um, yeah, and we have the payload, which is uh, a variable length payload from uh, zero to uh, 32 bytes, <coughs> and we also have a checksum um, uh, which can be configured to be uh, one byte or uh, yeah, two byte long. Um, Nordic uh, <coughs> announced uh, the Nordic multi sieber concept which is uh, uh, illustrated over here. So um, for example Logitech uh, uh, have the possibility to uh, have one receiver and Many devices, which are around the keyboard, around the computer, for example, uh, audio devices or keyboards, mouse, uh, beamers, uh, video beamers. So, and one of the the NRF24 uh, uh, transceiver family has uh, six pipes for um, uh, receiving uh, for addresses. Those addresses uh, over there. So we can have a multi receiver which is able to receive. Uh, those frames for a um, set of uh, um, uh, addresses. So this is a disadvantage for by uh, using those chips. It's almost transparent to the user. Um, we 
cannot sniff every shock burst frame easily because uh, the devices um, uh, filter the address and if the address doesn't match the address which is configured in the pipe, uh, the frame is not processed. So uh, this is the main problem for us. Um, yeah, and all those uh, different transceivers are all operating on one channel using this uh, multiceiver concept. <coughs> so we are almost interested in the payload, which is uh, everything we can see when we, for example, what we, what we did, uh, did was we uh, opened a Microsoft uh, keyboard and we uh, used the Microsoft keyboard to build our own transceiver. Um, yeah, we connected uh, the stuff to our Kikiri key and uh, yeah, look what, what we can do with it. So we can only access the payload because the payload is this data which uh, is um, provided by the, by the transceiver chip, uh, which is uh, connected through the SPI. Uh, bus. So the payload basically is what it's <coughs> transferred independent of the of the usage of the transmitting device. I mean you can uh, add other data to it, not only keyboards. So the vendor has now to implement something like a higher level protocol within the payload and so he has some responsibilities to take care especially on keyboards. For example, um, yeah, the, the vendor which uh, uh, built the device is responsible for authentication of the device. So nobody wants other guys uh, hanging around with, a, with another keyboard and uh, typing stuff like uh, command.exe. Uh, so uh, the vendor is uh, responsible for authentication, data protection, and the anti integrity of the entire computer system. So um, the USB receiver is, is the single line of defense, you can call it like this, yeah, um, because keystrokes, so we are talking about hit devices uh, which sends keystrokes to the computer, so it's almost like sitting right in front of the computer if you are able to send keystrokes. So this is the hardware we uh, uh, saw in the Microsoft receiver. Um, this is the USB dongle. Um, when you open it, you see there's uh, um, a pro programming interface. <coughs> Microsoft uh, programs a fixed address into the devices, so you are not able to, to, uh, to add more devices or different keyboards to, to one of those uh, uh, USB receivers. Uh, yeah, this is uh, the funny thing I, I will tell you, uh, tell, uh, tell you later. Um, yeah, this is uh, what we got out of the, the keyboard itself. And we uh, used the transceiver uh, chip for our own purposes, which that's, that's what you can see there. OK, so after we were able to receive all the stuff, uh, the next step was to analyze the, the payload, which is the only thing we can see so far. Uh, in this ex example, uh, we just pressed uh, the A, the B, and the space bar on the keyboard, and uh, we just looked at what, what is going to transmit over the air and the payload. So we s identified something like a um, uh, sequence ID counter, which is incremented. Uh, uh, this is um, encrypted, so it's not that obvious that it is uh, incremented by one. Um, we have our encrypted hit code. Yeah, so um, hit codes, uh, it's, it's like a table. You have your ASCII character and it's map, mapped to a, to a hit code uh, using a table. And um, for example, an A is uh, the four, the hit code four. A B is the hit code, hit code five. So, and we can see here, we uh, type uh, an A and we have C9. Uh, for a key down event, and a, this is a key release event, and we have something like a key pressed idle message here, so the receiver is able to identify how long a key is pressed. Um, yeah, this is the next keystroke, so we have the key B down here, and it's C8, so you can see a pattern. So the A character is a 4 and encrypted at C9, and the B character is a 5 and encrypted at C8. Uh, yeah, that's, that's the first thing you will see uh, if you look at it uh, in the first time. 
Yeah, and we have the ch we have a checksum within the payload. Uh, it's a different checksum. It has nothing to do with the short burst protocol. Uh, this checksum is uh, algorithm is Im imp uh, yeah, developed by Microsoft, and it's uh, still not clear uh, what kind of algorithm they use in detail. But yeah, we will talk about our uh, research finding here. Um, so this is uh, a bit more um, uh, compressed. Uh, you, you can see the payload for the key down event for an A and B, uh, C, and 2C is the hit code for the space uh, character. Um, so we found out if you have a look on this um, encrypted values, you, you will see that if you XOR those uh, hit codes which are encrypted, C9, with, uh, with, the, with the value CD, uh, we will get the, uh, the plain text for. We can uh, verify this by performing the same operation on, on C8. So the result is uh, what we expect, the hit code number five. So it is uh, quite obvious that there's a, an XOR encryption uh, in place again. Uh, but it looks a bit different. They have now not, not only one byte of XOR key, they have at least 10 bytes static key. Um, yeah. Now we, we just try to analyze the, the entire protocol to get an idea how the CRC uh, checksum algorithm works and uh, how, the, uh, how the encryption works. We found out that uh, we can generate packets and send those packets when having a correct checksum. Otherwise, the packet is uh, discarded uh, by, the, by the receiver. Um, yeah, so if we use this sequence ID and don't touch the sequence ID of this captured packet and just replay the packet, exchange our hit code and uh, calculate a new uh, CRC checksum using the static value uh, hex 53. Uh, we are able to send packets to the receiver, and uh, yeah, the receiver accepts the packets. Um, this doesn't work for different device addresses, so using a second keyboard with a different device address, this will not work anymore. So uh, we try to find out why. Oh, it's a serious. <coughs> so. For example, we have a device with the address CD 98350AC0, and yeah, we try to <laughs> illustrate. Um, this is a packet. The first line is a, the encrypted original packet payload. And uh, what we have seen is that uh, the key, this is a key down event, right? Is it? Uh, no. <laughs> uh, we take the device address and put them right under this, uh, yeah, we have the device address two times and XOR each character in the, in the original encrypted payload and we get this uh, plain text which looks quite okay. So we have some, some bit fields for meta characters, for example, that's what we have seen in the old uh, uh, technique, the 27 megahertz. Devices. So control, shift, alt, that's basically major <coughs> keys, yeah. It's just a bit in the bit field. So yeah, the plain text looks, yeah, well formed. So it makes sense. So we have our hit codes right over here. And we have some zeros and yeah, uh, we have our uh, sequence counter, which is incremented if you have a look on the different plain text packets. Yeah, a few pieces of information are still missing because we don't know how to process those bytes over here. The first uh, four bytes, it's still unknown how to proceed uh, with those bytes and also how to proceed with the single byte right before uh, the checksum, which is the last byte on this uh, packet. So yeah, there are protection mechanisms in place, as you can see, uh, we have an encryption, um, which is based on the same technique as uh, years ago. Um, yeah, and we had some challenges in protocol reversing because uh, 
to find out how, uh, how the CRC checksum algorithm works. Uh, the checksum is obviously built over the plain text. And yeah, since we are still unable to decrypt the first four bytes, we are still not able to uh, build correct checksums. So yeah, what's our challenge? What's next? Uh, since we don't have uh, baseband access using this NRF 24L01 chip, which is uh, uh, in, the, in the original devices, um, we can use a brute force technique to uh, get information about the address of devices uh, in, in the wireless network. So uh, an advantage of this uh, wireless technique is um, a Nordic Semiconductor implemented something like automatic retransmission on failure. We have uh, retransmission timeouts and we have uh, uh, an ACK whenever a payload is uh, accepted. And that's why we can also brute force valid addresses to get uh, addresses. If we can configure a valid address in our device, we are also able to sniff and we are also able to send. So, yeah, if we want to brute force the address, we uh, assume that 16 bits of the address space is uh, necessary to increment or yeah, to cycle. Uh, the addresses are quite similar and only two bytes differed uh, from what we have seen so far. <clears throat> so we have uh, maybe around uh, 23 hours uh, for um, yeah, brute forcing a valid address to uh, sniff and inject payloads in the future. Because it's a two-way communication, we always get a response when we have the proper address because we will get an egg back. The USB dongle is sending an egg back, yeah. so uh, I got a valid packet, everything is fine. Uh, other, uh, another method would be to implement, uh, to add a different receiver chip, which allows you to <coughs> basically directly process the data coming over the air on the signal and read the shock burst address right out of the packet. Yeah. <coughs> so that was how our desk looked like in the last days. Uh, that's a Logitech uh, keyboard, which is over here. It's a quite nice device. It's sad that everything is so broken. Um, yeah, we have uh, an AES a uh, 128 uh, uh, encryption in place. Um, yeah, that's what, th what we see if we have a look on the, on the payload, which is transmitted by Logitech keyboards. Um, this block is 8-byte <coughs> encrypted data. So to use AAS 128, we uh, might expect 16 bytes encrypted data. So we assume that, uh, uh, that the AAS algorithm is used to generate a, a random initialization value for a stream cipher. Uh, yeah. So we have a 4-byte sequence ID, which is uh, verified. Uh, we have four, bit, uh, four, four byte for sequence IDs. Uh, we have one byte for the checksum. The checksum algorithm is, uh, yeah, this is below. It's quite simple. <coughs> so we need the checksum algorithm to generate own payload. Yeah, uh, using static encryption key, which must be exchanged between the devices. Uh, Logitech states that um, it's that the static key is uh, exchanged during the synchronization process and the key is never transmitted directly over the air. So uh, we recognize several um, channel hopping sequences in, in, in the synchronization process and we assume that uh, there's an algorithm uh, which we don't know exactly how it works right now, but we assume that we have several uh, small time frames maybe 500 microseconds. And both devices, the keyboard and the receiver, expects an acknowledge for a packet. So the keyboard uh, expects an acknowledge packet from the receiver whenever they hit. So the, the keyboard is sending a packet and expects an acknowledge from the receiver. And whenever the keyboard gets the acknowledge, um, the channel number, which is only a small subset of 12 channels, is maybe used to derive the key. Uh, I tried to uh, illustrate the, the probable um, key generation algorithm below. So in fact, uh, the, the static key is never transmitted over the air. 
it's uh, yeah based maybe based on the uh, on the channels uh, which are hit. Yeah, we don't have so much time, so I told that already. Okay. Okay. <coughs> yeah. So I need to go back. Okay. You told that already. Yeah, I already told that. Um, yeah, so we recognize even if we press the same key several times, the encryption key block is uh, different. So that's why we think that uh, they are using the AES 128 uh, encrypted block for initializing a stream cipher. So we don't know anything about the, the encryption mode right now. That's what we, we are going to do the next days, maybe since we are able to perform replay attacks and yeah, perform a more detailed crypto analysis uh, later. But yeah, it was not able to finish this right now. <coughs> yeah, there are also different keyboards we had a look on. Uh, Fujitsu Siemens is, uh, yeah, it's not worth uh, uh, talking about because it's uh, also plain text and there are no protection mechanisms in place, so we are not going to talk about those. So you can devices. immediately see the hit codes in the transmitted payload. Yeah, it's, it's not, not worse. <laughs> yeah, so what, what maybe the countermeasures for uh, uh, vendors of uh, wireless keyboards and so, uh, such devices, uh, the usage of cryptographic hardware. Yes, the usage. Microsoft actually uh, use uh, hardware IS uh, uh, chips in their transceivers, but they don't use them. <laughs> That's a hard part of iPhone, so fine. So they are still using XOR, and uh, even if they have uh, a hardware IS on board. Yeah, um, limitations from the past. So the one-way communication doesn't apply uh, for today. So we can also perform a handshake and uh, more sophisticated uh, crypto algorithms, uh, public key exchange met methods, etc. Yeah. <coughs> I think we can skip this uh, uh, to have some more uh, time for our demonstration. Uh, last night we tried to uh, figure out how uh, how big is the distance to send packets uh, to a computer, which has uh, the Microsoft dongle inserted. So we used our kicker key. Uh, we have a an NRF transceiver chip right here, and we connected this uh, PCB using the SPI bus to uh, the existing Kikri key device. And yeah, um, unfortunately, the, the battery Actually. pack is empty, and yeah, so that's, that's so why you can just kurz umstöpseln here. Yeah. So basically, this uh, Kikri key now has a hard coded key sequence, which um, will be now uh, replied by just applying power to the device and yeah, just let me okay so here we have uh, a sender and we try to uh, uh, send some keystrokes so since we don't have a battery pack right now I'm, I'm using USB to power the device so that's all uh, it's no magic it's just for the power so now it's on, we wait a few seconds, and we have a command.exe started, just for demonstration purpose. Yeah, that's uh, what we wanted to show. Uh, and the distance in-house is around 75 meters using this antenna. Without any further modification on the antenna. So <coughs> you can see the little red circle. So this was where the transmission was still stable. We could go around the corner as well, but sometimes then the signal was lost without further modification. And yeah, the packet says about 10 meters. Um, yeah. It Nordic Semiconductor tell, told about 100 meters, and yeah, we found something in the middle. Yeah. yeah. We like to thank here some, some guys which actually supported us. That's uh, Nick and Brack and Eric for helping us in the various phases of that project and are now available for questions. Yeah. Uh, two minutes for questions. Um, any questions? Okay. okay. 
Thank, thank you. you very much. And thanks a lot. It was very interesting.